The Perfect Weapon is undeniably the ultimate Kempo film, but whatever happened to the sequel? We have Master Jeff Speakman with us today in the final of a four-part series analyzing how Kempo is represented in The Perfect Weapon. First, we're going to wrap up how the essence of Kempo culminates in the final battle, and then Mr. Speakman shares some insight with us on whatever happened to Perfect Weapon 2 and what it might have looked like. And you also won't believe what major Hollywood blockbuster almost became his second film. Let's talk about it. I think this is the a pinnacle for every uh, or a staple for every campus out there to have. It's like a requirement, almost <laughs> just to, to train in the art to see this film. Um, I want to talk about this last scene because we've we've focused on different themes and different scenes as these episodes went on. This one in particular, the final battle was really interesting to me because you've now infiltrated the warehouse and you're now facing off with Kerry Tagawa and James Hong, and you are attacked. And right off the bat, I believe you used um, Tammy Mace, it looks like, and you do a standard Campbell defense and you pretty much take out Tagawa pretty fast. What were your thoughts leading up to this final confrontation? I always, uh, I really pushed for trying to use Taming the Mace. So once again, good on you for recognizing your Kempo techniques. And then right after that, you know, there's a really, right before that, there's a really uh, important thing that happens when Kerry Tagawa comes up and pulls a gun on me first and I'm stuck. And James Hong tells him to move to the side to get me through the temple. <laughs> and the primary mandate of Kempo versus firearm your empty hands and the attacker has a firearm is to divert so if i can just take the barrel of the gun and move it a little bit now it's going to miss me even if you do fire now if at the same time i also move in the opposite direction so i double i increase the probability of not getting hit by the bullet by doing both move the barrel and move the target then your next concern is to be close enough to the person with the firearm to be able to control their next movement. It, and it's almost counterintuitive that somebody comes at you with a gun or a knife and you want to get closer to them. You know, that just that first thought that really doesn't work. But then if you go into it, then you realize, well, if the guy's here to kill me and he's using a deadly weapon, you have to control and contain that distance so he doesn't get a second chance to use that weapon on you again you must choose an extremely aggressive response and that is always going to be take your sight take your breath or both i'm never going to try to do something divert the gun and then step back and then come at you a second time you got one time if you're lucky enough and fortunate enough to get out of the line of fire you will not have that chance again and what's fun for that, at least for me as a viewer watching that, is you dispose of, of Tanaka. I'm not sorry. You dispose of uh, Tagawa so quickly that in the distance you see Tanaka showing up on the boat. Now we're expecting this big epic Kempo battle. And what I love is when he shows up and comes at you, it seems at first that the Kempo doesn't work against him. So this is a kind of like right. almost a step back. It's the first time in the movie <clears> where you're really, the techniques that we've seen up to this point, the perfect weapon isn't working against this foe who, and you're hitting him hard and, or at least it perceives as hard and it's just not affecting him. Um, just what was the approach to fighting a character like him? What did you and Mr. Parker want to achieve with this scene? We needed to make it abundantly clear what you just highlighted which is we wanted to make his character bigger than life. And the odds of me being able to use my tempo on this guy diminish greatly because of his size and the skill and his general attitude on life. A funny thing, not so funny, but an interesting thing that happened. First, we're, we're filming nights. So, you know, you show up on the set when the sun is going down so that you can get into makeup and get into war bugs. So now the sun is, and you're gonna shoot until the sun comes up. And those are difficult because yesterday you might've been shooting in the afternoon. So you get six hours off and now you gotta come back and do a fight scene for 12 hours. Those are the days that are particularly taxing. But as you recall in that fight scene, uh, there's a point where he's got the best of me and he grabs the back of my hair and he grabs the back of my belt and he pulls back and he throws me into a whole bunch of barrels. Okay, so the next day, just like a typical Kempo black belt class, when you get up the next day, you're sore because you got hit 
and you got pummeled and you get up and you're like, oh man, and you start stretching and oh, there's a, we look in the mirror and there's a bruise that wasn't there last night. So after, after that fight scene the next morning, I get up and I'm doing that same, wow, am I, holy cow, that was a lot of work and I got hit and all that. And I kept getting up and the small of my back was so sore, like I've never had it before. And I thought, God, that is really, you know, no matter what I do, the pain is still there. So I go to a mirror and I turn around and I look behind me and there are five blue dots of bruises on the small of my back where his fingertips hit before he grabbed the belt to throw me. So that tells you how strong that guy's grip was. That's I mean, that wrestler's was, grip right there. Wrestler's grip. He was unbelievably strong. This guy was a monster, you know, and he would come into the West LA school before we did the movie. I had actually met him before, just walk in every now and then and hang out. And and I think, which we mentioned in one of the earlier uh, chapters of this particular sequence, <clears throat> that, you know, the really the unsung heroes of an, a movie like this are the stuntmen. I mean, the stuff they go through is just, you know, put on a gorilla suit, light yourself on fire and throw down throw yourself down two layers of metal stairs. I mean, you know, the things they do are just incredible. And they just get up and dust themselves off and go, okay, what's next? And I want to kind of return back to the um, to the fight with Mr. Tanaka. Uh, there's a particular pattern I, I noticed watching the, this part of the movie and the, and the first part. In the flashback at the beginning, when young Jeff um, faces off with the football player that, that hits his younger brother, mm -hmm there's a sequence of kicks that you deliver or that your character delivers jeff in the film delivers almost the exact same sequence of kicks to <laughs> professor tanaka and i find right. it interesting because at the beginning it worked too well and now it's not working at all is there any sort of symbolism that you guys were trying to strive for this or is that just a happy accident it, no it played back into the motive what we needed to do was throughout the movie and and Toro Tanaka's introduction into the film as continue to build him as this unmovable, unbeatable force, a killing machine on <clears throat> such a huge level that even though I was able to get some ground work covered with him, I wound up having to blow him up at the end of the, <laughs> the fight scene because I couldn't use my chem. That was part of the logic of that escalation of how serious this guy is and what kind of trouble that I was in. And then the real point of all of that being taken to that level was at the very end of the movie, when I bring James Hong's body slung over my shoulders in the fireman's carry to my dad and I lay him down and he kind of unrolls from the sheet. I've got him wrapped in and he's still alive. And, and my dad can't believe it and that I would spare his life, that I wouldn't take his life in to know he was responsible for taking the life of my friend. Um, that's the moral equivalence, because here's the question that plays out there in that scene and then in life for all of us, which is, if you kill the killer, do you suddenly become that thing you used to fight against? And that's the human dilemma you know, where is it appropriate to use deadly force and not? Jeff Sanders made the choice not to kill James Hong. And that's right. a theme that's introduced earlier in the film when your character is leaving town and, and you're going up to your, your Kempo master and he's describing the difference between the tiger and the dragon, which I want to kind of deep dive into just a little bit here that the whole concept of the tiger being you know brute power brute strength earthly earthly strength <clears> and then the dragon being also powerful but wise he makes a point to saying that the dragon has a choice but the tiger does not and there's many times in the film we see your character rely on the tiger rely on the tiger so the tiger takes out the football player does a lot of damage you're resorting to the tiger you know with professor tanaka it doesn't work it was only when your character starts to embrace the the dragon and thematically start thinking on a different level thinking and approach a different way that you start to have success in the film and i think that's at the end you're talking right. about when you when you let james hong live that your character has made that final balance between between the two halves yes and exactly the writer dave wilson 
uh, who, who did an amazing job. I got to know him quite well. And exactly what you described is sort of how I spoke to him. You know, these are the, the iconic metaphors of the martial art world, certainly of the Chinese and Japanese, which you laid out perfectly, which is the tiger is this master of the physical domain and the dragon really doesn't exist. It's an amalgam of different animal parts, the body of a serpent, the head of a jackal, the wings of a dragon, the talons of an eagle. And so it really doesn't exist. It's a, it's a metaphysical uh, collage of different ideas. And it's always above looking down at the tiger and the tiger is always down below looking up at the dragon. And that duality like that and the, the dragon always is holding this pearl, which is the, the pearl of wisdom, right? He's the guardian of the wisdom, the, the ethereal, the non-physical. And the, the tiger down here is a little bit of red in his mouth, but he's gold. And the serpent's body is completely red with some gold fins or flames along the back. So it is a perfect example of the yin yang symbol. There's this with a little bit of that, and there's the opposite of that with a little bit of this. And they are interdependent on one another. And so that brings us to the conclusion of what is your perspective? How do you look at life? What do you think is right and wrong? All those things play out in that symbology of the tiger and the dragon and how they work paradoxically in opposition to one another, but yet they both work in tandem to one another. There has to be this to be that. And we see this throughout the film. We see in <clears throat> Mako's apartment, who's your mentor, he's got a dragon statue and it's it's in the foreground mm -hmm. as he's advising you. And we see that the ring, people ask about that ring all the time if it's a real ring, but I love the symbolism, the symbolism of the ring in yeah. the movies that your character is always changing it. Like you, you're always showing close-ups of it and you're touching it, but there's one moment in the end fight with Professor Tanaka where you're on the ground and he's like, he's putting the flower in his, in his, um, pocket he's getting ready to right. deliver the killing blow where your character touches the ring but the way you did it and the framing and the camera shot actually looks like you're in the salutation stance it's mm -hmm. as if the tiger and dragon in that moment are finally coming together and that right. jeff has found that balance right when i began to get close to ed parker started going to his house every week uh, which we did for three and a half years i realized that i was in the presence of a very special person and a man who, you know, I refer to as the Einstein of martial arts, right? Because he, uh, uh, <clears throat> don't get me wrong, I'm very proud of what we've done, how far we've gone, where we're going to go. That's a home run. But we did not invent it. We were not the innovators of how to think this way, how to move this way, how to create solutions this way. Ed Parker was. So we took his spirit and his philosophy and his intellect and we went farther down that road and i'm very thrilled that we did that but let's not you know mince words here i'm not ed parker i didn't create the kind of thinking and the presence that he had he was the creator of one of the things that sets them apart is they can be with a group of really really smart people and everybody looking at the same thing but there's one person that sees something there that nobody else sees they have the ability to see beyond the pragmatic into the theoretical and moving forward and that's what he was he was a guy who would look at the ancient chinese fighting techniques and figure out how to apply physics and principles and cause and effect relationships moving your body through time and space at a particular angle to be able to deliver a maximum impact strike to a given target to create a reaction that you're aware of that you take advantage of that reaction before the person can recover, right? Think about how brilliant that is. That is truly groundbreaking and truly amazing. And that's why he deserves all that credit. Those are the gifts he gave to us. I would like to end this on a little bit more of a hypothetical fun note. Every time we do an episode, um, our viewers really react to the FIO material and our topics together. But there's always a comment that comes up a lot. <clears throat> a lot of people will say is, when are we going to see Perfect Weapon 2? And I just thought it might be fun to kind of dip into that. If I understand correctly, at one point in time, there was a sequel in development. Um, is there anything that you could tell us about that project or what it might have looked like? 
Um, <clears throat> it was in theoretical concept back when Paramount was in that business. But what happened was, so I had um, associated myself with a particular, I signed with a producer who made his name through Van Damme's first three movies. His name was Mark DeSalle. He was done with his Van Damme contract. The guy that wrote Van Damme's second movie, Kickboxer, he was one of the acting coaches at the at the studio I studied acting at for five years. <clears throat> so we became friends and then I found out he wrote that movie. I said, oh, I do this thing called Tempo. Why don't you come down and see it? And so he did. And after he saw it, he called the sound and he said, you got to come see this Kempo stuff because they, I've never seen anything like this. And it took him several times to try to get. So finally, Mark DeSalle showed up at the West Los Angeles Dojo and I did a demo for him. We signed a four picture deal and then he took that and went to Paramount. So he's tied with all four of those pictures. After we did the first one called The Perfect Weapon, they immediately went into what is Speakman's second movie going to be? Because we got him for three more, for sure. So they had all those options. So they were moving together, putting together a perfect weapon too. What storyline they were adapting into, that I don't know. Because I wasn't a part of that conversation. But before that developed further, the, the next head of Paramount came in, Brandon, Tar uh, Brandon Tartikoff. And a wonderful man. I met with him several times and he was so kind. And the other people that were around him that I knew outside of Paramount said he was 200% in the Speakman camp, going to make him one of the pillars of the new Paramount model that's coming out. And then a few months later, he died of a tragic heart attack. So the first person that was running the studio was gone. Tartar cooked off came in, he's gone. Now the third person comes in, Sherry Lansing, who again was wonderful and very, very kind to me. But now I'm three levels away, <laughs> you know? So mostly if, if Paramount did another Speakman movie and it was successful, no matter who did it, they're gonna go give the credit to the first person that brought me to Paramount. And that's what nobody wants. So I can't go anywhere because Paramount owns all the options. They paid for them. So they don't want to do another movie. So they don't want to let you out to do another movie because what if I went to Warner Brothers and they had a huge hit? You know, somebody's going to get in trouble for that. So they would rather sit you on a shelf, as they say, pay you the commiserate fees that they would have to to keep you well, tied to them. And then when the time factor expires, then you're out. And that's exactly what happened. I uh, watched a previous interview with you uh, from a couple of years ago where you had discussed that you were at one point attached to a script that would eventually become the film Speed. Can you elaborate yeah. on that a little bit? And if it had been produced for as a Just Speaking film, how would Kempo have been implemented into a film like that? We were in the process of doing that. Um, <clears throat> this goes back to what happens when somebody at the top loses their job or they pass away or whatever and then a whole new regime comes in there especially with a big company there is so much going on in a very little amount of time so paramount had me come in and read a script that they owned and i sat there in their office and read it in you know an hour or so it was incredible and i said this is it if this is the second speakman movie after Perfect Weapon, we're done. You know, we're we're at the top of the pile. We're going anywhere you want to go. So I had the biggest agency then. I had the biggest lawyers then. Everybody's in. We accepted it. That's the one we're doing this movie for Speakman. Then in an interim area where Brendan Tartikoff was no longer there before Sherry Lansing came in, there was a person temporarily running Paramount. He took that script and put it in what they call turnaround, which is if you're a studio and there are the other three studios and you want to get rid of a project that you're invested in, you just put it up there and go, okay, if you want the script, you can have it for 200 or 400,000, whatever we got into it, you can buy it. He did that and 
uh, Warner Brothers picked it up in a heartbeat and it was the movie Speed, which was the movie they were developing for me. So we actually hired a writer and he was writing, rewriting the script so that the direction of the bad guy would be, you have to stop the bus at this location, get out and go get a whatever. And that would put me out of the bus and I'd be into a fight scene and then I'd have to jump back on the bus and we would go on. So it would be this milk run of on the bus going from one fight scene to the next. And then when that whole, so, so he put it in turnaround, they picked it up, made it with, uh, what's his name? Keanu Reeves. And it was a huge success. And that was actually slated to be my second movie at Paramount. And as ridiculous as that sounds, that kind of thing happens really pretty regularly in Los Angeles and Hollywood. But that's what ended my career at Paramount. So imagine that, you know, you come off a perfect weapon. You work that hard. You do such a good job selling it. You're totally committed. Right after the movie is finished, you lose Ed Parker. He dies of a heart attack at age 59. We were supposed to be together, traveling all over the world. The master and the student opened it. I mean, it was perfect, right? We're just out the gate, and then, then I go through his death. Then we go through this travesty with the movie speed and there's no more movies for speakman to or paramount but i'm still tied to the other producer that brought me in there the guy who started uh jean-claude van damme so he took his three options and went out and that's when we did street night my second movie i did from warner brothers if you were to make the perfect weapon two today in a hypothetical universe how would you implement 50 in it any particular <laughs> scenes in the particular locations fight uh, techniques, any any elements that you would love to have seen come together for uh, a, an ideal sequel? I would put going to the ground by choice in a mass attack at the end when I'm fighting the last guy. Because then I don't have to make the conscious choice to go to the ground and put myself in a very vulnerable position. <laughs> no matter how good you are down there, you're much more vulnerable on the ground than you are standing up when there's more than one person. So I would try to implement it in that logical sequence. And then I would put in how Tempo 5.0 ground is different than Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or MMA. What is it that we do down there that makes us stand out to the point where I can say to you and everybody listening, in all good conscience, what we did was we made a Kempo ground system. We didn't take Kempo karate and Jiu Jitsu and, and say, okay, m Monday and Wednesday, we're doing Kempo Tuesday, Thursday, we're doing Jiu Jitsu. We put it together in one cohesive system. So <clears throat> that was always my intent to make it a Kempo ground system, not a extension of Jiu Jitsu. Because who's got 20 years to throw on top of, you know, 20 years of Kempo to get that good at jujitsu? You know, I'm a white belt in jujitsu. I went four years to Mr. Nathan's in school. I never got out of being a white belt. And I'm all going to die a white belt in jujitsu, even though I wore white gi and a white belt. <clears throat> I'm great with that. You know, I'm not there to get belts or to compete. I'm there for information. And then to figure out how to bring these two worlds together and into one system. And that's the world we live in today. Well, I personally want to thank you so much for the work you've put into Kempo 5.0, the effort you've spent, and the dedication and investment of time getting it out there. I had a taste of it years ago. I found a lot of value in it. And I'm really happy to see how big the family has gotten and that it's actually prospering. And I would especially like to thank you for your time to spend with us today and not just today, but these other episodes where we talked about, you know, these hypotheticals and the symbolism of Kempo in the movies. And so again, I just can't um, express enough gratitude. And um, is there any message that you would like viewers to have who, who have either seen the film or not seen the film? And what does the name Perfect Weapon mean to you? Yeah, the you know, the thing that I would like to express to you personally is my gratitude. <clears throat> you have helped enormously with getting the word out of 5 and who we are and what we do and why we do it. So you have my gratitude, my respect for doing that. 
And just um, in closing, I would say to all people that respectfully question authority, create solutions instead of more problems as you move forward. And this is what we have done in the 5.0 system. And if those words resonate to you, if you find value in them, then please look at who we are. You, you can go online. You can study clandestinely from our online academy, which you go to jeffspeakman.com, go to the top right-hand corner, click on the 5.0 University, and you will see the online academy. You can, you can just study online and get an idea of who we are and what we are. And if you are of the same energetic value and how you think of the world, then you have found a new home. If you don't think that way, this is not your place. I'm, I'm not after students. I'm after living a certain way for the rest of my life on planet Earth. And, and I'm doing exactly that. And I'm going to do that tomorrow. Well said. And thank you so much, sir. I really appreciate everything and I really appreciate your time. Thank you, sir. So while we never got a sequel to one of the best martial arts films out there, it is fun to explore what it could have looked like. Now, I'd like to thank Master Speakman for spending so much time with us and sharing his personal experiences on making the perfect weapon. Now, this was a four-part series, and you can find the links to the other three episodes in the description down below. If you're hungry for more, Mr. Speakman has an entire catalog of films that he made that feature Kempo, as well as building and establishing his Kempo 5.0 system, which is one of the largest and most prominent branch-offs of Ed Parker's art. So if you want to know all about Kempo 5.0, you can find it all right here.